Welcome everyone to this PyTorch crash course. This course should teach you everything you need to know to get started with PyTorch. And I'll not only show you how to code a simple neural network, we also have a look at some of the underlying basics because I really want to make sure that you have a great understanding of how the framework works. And if you follow this tutorial, then you should have a great foundation and should be able to apply the concepts to all your own deep learning projects. Now, the prerequisites you need is just some decent Python skills. However, I will not explain deep learning concepts like backpropagation or how a neural network works. So if you want to learn more about this, you can check out our deep learning explain series that you can find on our channel. I will put the link in the description below together with some more helpful resources for you. And now without further ado, let's get started. So first of all, if you want to install it on your machine, you can go to pytorch.org and then here select your configuration, your operating system, package manager, your CUDA version, if you have GPU support or only CPU and then grab this command and run it in your terminal. Or the easiest way to get started with it is just use a Google Colab. Here you also get a free GPU. So in my opinion, this is the easiest way for you to get started and to follow me here. So I recommend to just use this. And then here you can also select runtime and change this to a GPU like I did here. And now, first of all, let's go over the overview, what we will learn today. So I divided this course into five chapters. First, we have a look at tensor basics. Then we have a look at the autograd in PyTorch to compute gradients. Then we learn how a typical training loop looks like with a PyTorch model, loss and optimizer. Then we build our first neural network and then we also build a convolutional neural network. So these are the five chapters and along the way we also pick up a few other important concepts. So for example, we learn how we can integrate it with NumPy, how we get GPU support, then we see a linear regression example. We learn the typical PyTorch training pipeline. Then we also pick up concepts like data sets, data loader, transforms, and how to evaluate the model, and also how to save and load the model. So in my opinion, these are all the important concepts you need to know to have a great foundation here. So now let's get started. First, let's talk about tensors because everything in PyTorch is based on tensor operations. A tensor is a multidimensional matrix containing elements of a single data type. So this is similar to a NumPy and D array, but here we also have GPU support. So now let's learn how we can create different tensors. For this, we import torch. So this is the PyTorch package and we don't have to install this. This is pre-installed in the Colab, which is pretty cool. Now, one function we can, for example, use is torch empty and then specify the size. This will just use uninitialized values. For example, empty one will only put in one value. Empty three will put in three values in one dimension. Two by three will give us a matrix or even more dimensions, of course. Then we can use torch rand. This will initialize it with random numbers between zero and one or torch zeros or torch ones to fill this with zeros and ones. And now if we run this and then have a look at the different tensors, then we see this is MT1, this is MT3, this is two by three. Then here we have the random numbers and here we have zeros. Then we can check the size of a tensor by either saying x.size as function or x.shape as attribute. So in this example, we see this is five by three. And if we want to access a specific dimension, we can do it like so. So we either say x.size zero as function argument or x shape zero as index. So this would print five in this example. Then we can check the data type by calling D type. Um, by default, this is float32, but we can also specify a concrete data type when we create this. So here we say D type equals float16. And now if we print this, then we see the second tensor here has torch float16. We can also construct it from different data, like from a list or from a NumPy array by saying torch tensor and then put in the data. So now if we print this, then we see we now have this as a tensor in this data type. 
Then this is also pretty important. So a tensor has a argument requires grad and by default, this is false. So if we set this to true, then this will tell PyTorch that it will need to calculate the gradients for this tensor. And we need this later in the optimization step. So we use this for all variables in our model that we want to optimize. So later this will get more clear, but for now just keep this in mind that each tensor, tensor can have this argument. So now if we print this, we see it also prints requires grad was set to true for this tensor. Then let's talk about different operations we can do with tensors. So this is also similar to NumPy arrays. We can do operations like addition or subtraction, multiplication, division. So usually you just use this syntax. So we say X plus Y. And what's important here is that this will do element wise addition. We can also use the function torch at and then here specify the tensors. But like I said, usually just these operations are used. Or we can use a the function with an underscore. So at underscore, this will mean it is an in place addition. So also just keep this in mind that you could also do it like this. So if we run this and then print x, y and c after the addition, then you see we got the element wise addition. Then similar, we can do subtraction, multiplication or division. Then we can also do slicing. So access different parts of the tensor. So also similar to a NumPy array. So for example, if we say X and then colon comma zero, then this will give us all rows in column zero. One comma colon will give us row one and then all columns. Then here this will give us only one element at this position. And if we only have one element, then we can call dot item. So this will give us the actual float value, not just the tensor. So if we print this, then you see these are the different ones. And for example, if we say x11, then we get this as tensor. And if we say x11 item, then we only get the float value. Then we can reshape the tensor by calling x.view. This will return a new tensor. For example, this is a four by four. And if we say X view, then 16, this, then this is only of size 16. Then we can also use a minus one for one dimension. So for example, if we say minus one eight, then PyTorch will automatically determine the correct size. So in this case, it needs two then so that we get 16 values. So if we run this and then see for, uh, for the last one, we get two by eight. So then let's learn how we can convert a tensor to a NumPy array or vice versa. For this, if we have a tensor and want to have this as a NumPy array, we can simply say um, dot NumPy and call this on a tensor. So if we run this and then check the data type, then now you see this is a NumPy and D array. But here we have to be careful. So if the tensor is on the CPU, then both objects will share the same memory location. So if we change one, if we do an in place addition, for example, and then print both of them, then you see it also modified the tensor. So it modified the tensor and the NumPy array. If we want to do it the other way around, we can either use torch.fromNumPy or again this torch tensor. And here's a big difference. So again, torch from NumPy will share the same memory and torch tensor will create an actual copy. So if we run this and then, for example, modify this, then you see C with torch tensor did not get modified, but this from NumPy got modified. So again, keep this in mind that this will share the same memory address. Now let's talk about GPU support. So by default, all the tensors are created on the CPU, but we can also move them to the GPU if it's available, or we can create them directly on the GPU. So usually in the code, you see a line that looks like this. So we can check um, if we have a GPU by saying torch CUDA is available. 
And then we create a device. So we say torch device and we name this either CUDA if the GPU is available or otherwise simply CPU. If you have multiple GPUs, you can also, for example, say colon and then zero to move it to the first device, to the first GPU or colon one and so on. And then if we have this and then we can move the tensors to the device by saying to and then the device. So in this case, if the GPU is available, then this would be the CUDA device and then it would move it to the GPU. Or if you just want to do it explicitly, you can say X to CPU and use this as a string or X to CUDA and again as a string. Or you can create them right away on the GPU if you say, for example, use a function and then as argument you say device equals the GPU device. So this is usually more efficient because here we first create it on the CPU and then move it to the GPU. So this is a small optimization that you can do if you know that you need this on the GPU. So yeah, then create them right away. So yeah, this is how to work with tensors. And now let's move on and have a look at the AutoGrad. The AutoGrad package provides automatic differentiation for all operations on tensors. So generally speaking, Torch AutoGrad is an engine for computing the vector Jacobian product. It computes partial derivatives while applying the chain rule. So you don't have to worry about this too much because all of this will be taken care of for us. But Autograd is a very essential part of PyTorch because whenever we want to train and optimize our neural network, then this involves computing the gradients. So this is a very important concept and I want to make sure that you understand how this works. So whenever we want to calculate the gradient, I mentioned this before, then we have to set requires grad equals true. So let's look at an example. In this case, we want to know the gradients with respect to X. So when we create this tensor, we say requires grad equals true. And now what will happen is that whenever we do operations with this tensor, then these operations will be tracked on a so-called computational graph. So in this case, we do an addition and store this in another tensor Y. And now if we print X and Y and run this, then you notice that Y now has this attribute grad FN, so the gradient function. And in this case, it's called add backward. And this is because we do an addition here. And then later we use a technique that is called backpropagation. So first we do the calculations in the forward direction and then we go in the backward direction and calculate the gradients. So that's why this is called add backward. And if you want to learn more about how backpropagation works, I put the link in the description. So yeah, then we can access the gradient function. And now if we do more operations, for example, here a multiplication and then a mean, then you see after each operation, we have this gradient function. So here mal backward and now mean backward. So all these operations are tracked. And now if we want the gradient, the only thing we now have to do is call C, so the, the last tensor, and then C dot backward. So in this case, this will calculate the gradient of C with respect to X, so DC over DX. And now um, X has a grad attribute. So if we print X grad before, you will see this is none. And now after calling backward and doing the back propagation, now we have the gradient of X. So yeah, this is how the gradient calculation works. We set requires grad equals true. Then all the operations will be tracked. So usually this is the forward pass through our network. And then in the end, we calculate a loss, for, ex for example, the mean squared error. And then we call loss.backward. And then we have the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights. So yeah, this is how this concept works. And now this here is very important. So we have to be careful because whenever we call backward, 
then this accumulates the gradient for this tensor into the dot grad attribute. So usually when we do our training, we have a for loop. So for epoch in epochs, we iterate over the number of epochs. And then in each time we call backward. And now this would change the results. So we have to make sure to empty the gradients in each iteration. So for this, we call something like optimizer zero grad or gradients dot zero. So this is very important to remember. Later, this will be a no brainer because I show you how a typical training pipeline looks like. And then you hopefully always remember this. But for now, um, keep this in mind that this would accumulate the gradient. So we want to make sure to empty them in each iteration again. So yeah, this is how it works. And as I said, this will track the operations on a tensor. So sometimes there are situations where we don't want to track this. For example, when we do our training loop and then want to update the weights, or after the training, when we do the evaluation, then these operations should not be part of the gradient computations. And there are a few ways how we can prevent this. So we can use require scrat, we can use detach, or we can use with no torch dot no grat. So let's let's look at all of these examples. So require scrat changes the flag in place. So first, for example, if we create a tensor by default, this is false, requires grad equals false. And now if we set this, then afterwards, this is um, true. So here, when we print requires grad, and then we print the gradient function, we see this is false and none. And now if we change this to true, and then again do operations, then now the flag is true. And now we also have a gradient function. And the same way we can change this back to false. Then we could use dot detach. So this will create a new tensor with requires grad equals false. So yeah, this will create a copy. And this is a second way of preventing the gradient calculations. And the second, a third way is to wrap this in with torch dot no grad. For example, here we have a tensor where we have requires grad equals true. And then we say with torch dot no grad. And now again, we do calculations and check if we have a gradient and then we see this is false. So yeah, you will see this very often when we do, for example, the evaluation of the model after the training. So yeah, now let's look at one example how to do linear regression with this autograd package. So in linear regression, we have a very simple function f of x equals the weights times x plus a bias b. And in our example, we want to approximate a very simple function f of x equals two times x and we ignore the bias, so this is zero. So let's learn how to do this and train this in PyTorch. So first we need training samples x and y. So for x we have this tensor and for y we have this tensor and here the values are 2 times x. Then we need a tensor for the weights. So w equals this and we initialize it with 0. And now later we need to calculate the gradients with respect to the weights. So for this, we said require scrat equals true. And now all operations we do with W are tracked on our graph. So then we define a function that we call forward. This will do the forward pass and give us the model output. So in our example, this is simply W times X. Then we also define a function to calculate the loss. And in case of linear regression, we use the mean squared error. So we can calculate this by saying the predictions minus the actual values to the power of two, and then the mean. And now first, let's create a test sample five and do the forward pass with five. And now let's look at the output. And then you see in the beginning, the prediction is zero because our weights are zero in the beginning. And now we want to find the, the weights that we need. So we want to train our model. So for this, we define a learning rate and also the number of epochs. And then we say for epoch in range number of epochs. Then first we do the predictions. So here we do the forward pass. 
Then we calculate the loss by saying the actual values and the predictions. And now for the loss, we want the, uh, the, the gradients of the loss with respect to W. So we only have to call L dot backward. This is all we need to do. And now our gradient W has this grad attribute. So here we wrap this in with torch dot no grad because we don't want to track this calculation. And then we update our weights. So this is simply the formula of gradient descent. So minus equals the learning rate times the gradient. And with this, we update the weights. And now, as I said, we have to to remember to empty the gradients before the next iteration. So for this, we say w.grad.0. And then here we can also print the progress. And then after the training, do the forward pass again with the test sample and print this. And now let's run this. And this was very quick. And you see after epoch 10, the weights are two. It's actually already after epoch 20 and the prediction is 10. So this is correct. And this is how you can use the autograd package and train a linear regression example. Now let's go one step further and learn about model loss and optimizer and how a typical PyTorch pipeline looks like. Because in the example before, we've done a lot of these steps ourselves. So we defined the weights tensor and the forward function to calculate the model output and also the loss. But we actually don't have to do this ourselves because for this we can use a built-in loss function. And also during training, here we've done the update calculations ourselves. But again, for this we can simply use a built-in optimizer. So let's learn how to do this. And a typical PyTorch pipeline looks like this. First, we design the model. So here we define the input and output shapes and then the forward pass with the different layers. Then we construct the loss and the optimizer. And then we do the training loop with these steps. First, we do the forward pass where we compute the predictions and then the loss. Then we do the backward pass where we compute the gradients and then we update the weights. So let's learn how to do the linear regression example with the PyTorch way. So for this, we also import torch NN as NN. So this is the neural network module that we need. Then here again, we define the training samples. And here be careful because PyTorch, uh, PyTorch model classes expect this in a specific shape. So for this, we need an inner list here with all the samples. So if we extract the samples and features by calling x.shape and print this, then you see we have eight samples and one feature. So this is a shape of eight by one. And then also for the test samples, we need to put the five in a list. And now the first step is to design the model. So for this, we create a class and we call this linear regression and a PyTorch model class always inherits from nn.module. And then we have to implement these two functions. So the init function and the forward function. In the init function, first, we don't have to forget to also call the super init. And now here we define all the different layers that we want to apply in our model. So usually these are all the different layers in our neural network. In case of linear regression, we only use one layer. So here we can use the NN linear layer. This will do exactly this um, calculation W times X plus a bias. And in the forward pass, so in the init function, we usually define all the layers. And in the forward pass, we apply the layers. So here we simply say return self.lin. And this always gets the X, so the tensor as input. Then after defining the class, of course, we have to create a model instance. So we say model equals linear regression with the input size and output size. And this is just the number of features. So this is simply one. So only one output for our linear regression example. 
And then here we print the prediction before the training. So I think this will again be zero. And now the second step is to define the loss and optimizer. So for this, we can use the built-in classes. So in case of the loss, we say nn.mse loss. So again, this is the mean squared error loss. And for the optimizer, we get this from the torch optim module. So torch optim SGD. So this stands for stochastic gradients descent. Um, there are more optimizers available. So for this, check out the documentation. And the optimizer always gets model parameters. So these are the weights or the parameters that are optimized. And then it also gets the learning rate. So you can play around with this. This is a hyperparameter. And now we do the last step, so the training loop. So for this, we say for epoch in the number of epochs. And now we do the three steps. First, we do the forward pass. And for the forward pass, we only have to call the model. So if we call the model, then this will internally call the forward pass and return self.lin. So these are the predictions. Then with the predictions, we calculate the loss. So this again needs the actual values and the predictions. And then we call loss.backward and calculate the gradients. And now we only have to call optimizer step. And also remember, we have to empty the gradients. So we also have to call optimizer zero grad. And this is how a typical training loop looks like. So we have the forward pass, calculate the loss, then we do the backward pass, and then we call optimizer step and optimizer zero grad. And this optimizer step will then update the model parameters. And then here we print the progress. For example, here we print the new uh, model parameters. So this is the W and the B. And then after the prediction, we again call the model and do the forward pass and calculate the value. So let's run this. And you see that after 100 epochs, we have a prediction. So in the beginning, this is our prediction. So it did not get initialized with zero, but with some random values. And now after the training, it is close to 10, so 10.099. So yeah, this is how a training loop works the PyTorch way. And now let's look at a little bit more complex example. Let's learn how to train our first neural network. Now to create our first neural network, we actually follow this exact same pipeline approach. First, we design the model. Now, in this case, we define the different neural network layers. Then we define the loss and optimizer, and then we do the training loop with these steps. So if you have understood this approach here, then you're already halfway there and the next steps should be pretty easy to follow. So that's why I also want to add a few more concepts in this chapter. So here I also want to show you how we can leverage the GPU, how we can use the built-in data sets and data loader, how we can use built-in transforms and also how we do the evaluation after the training. So let's have a look at this code. So again, we do our imports, torch and torch nn. Then now we also want torch vision and torch vision transforms. And we also want matplotlib. And now I've showed this before. First, we define the device and we say that the device equals torch device. And now we say this is CUDA if torch CUDA is available. And otherwise, it's simply the CPU. Then we define the hyperparameters. So I think it's good practice to define this somewhere in the top of your file or also in a separate configuration file. So in this case, we define the input size. So in our case, we use the MNIST data set and this consists of images of shape 28 by 28. So if we flatten this, then it's this size. Then we also define a hidden size and the number of classes. So this is 10 because we have 10 different digits. Then we can define the number of epochs and a batch size and the learning rate. And then first of all, we create the data set. And for this, we create a training data set and a test data set. And for this, we use the 
built-in Torch Vision datasets MNIST dataset. This needs the root where this will be stored. Then we also say download equals true if it's not yet there. Then for the training data set, we say train equals true. And for the testing, we say train equals false. And then also right away, we can specify a built-in transform. So in this example, we simply want transforms to tensor because right now this could be, for example, a pillow image or a NumPy array. And if we specify this here, then we can transform this to a tensor right away. So this is how to use built-in transforms. In the next example, we see how we can add a different transform. And yeah, after defining the data set, we always define the data loader. So again, a training data loader and a testing data loader. And this is also a built-in data loader class that we can use. And a data loader provides an optimized way to iterate over the data set. So the data loader always gets a data set. So in this case, the training data loader gets the training data set and the test loader gets the test data set. Then we can define a batch size and we can also say shuffle equals true for the training. And now we can iterate over this, for example, either in a for loop or just to show you an example, I convert this to a iterator by calling iter. And then we can say um, examples.next. This will give us one batch of the data set and we can unpack this into the X and Y. So, sorry, X is the data and Y is the targets. And then in this case, I simply want to do a simple a matplotlib um, code and just print the first um, examples in this batch. So you see these are the MNIST digits. And now let's create our pipeline. So again, first we create our network, so our model. So again, this is a class neural net that inherits from nn.module. And again, we need to implement the init and the forward function. So forward always gets self and x, but in it only needs self. So here we are pretty flexible. So for example, we can leave this out if we don't need this configuration. But in our case, we want to specify input size, hidden size, and the number of classes. And now again, don't forget to call super in it. And now here we define all the layers we want in our model. So in this case, we first want one linear layer. Then we want one activation function. So for activation functions, there are also a lot of different ones available. For example, the ReLU is very common or we can use the softmax, for example. So all of them are also available in NN. And then in the end, we use another linear layer. And now notice the input and output shape. So first we specify input size and this will put um, the hidden size as output. And then the second layer gets the hidden size as input and the number of classes, so 10 as output. And then in the forward pass, we call and apply all those layers. So first we call the first linear layer, then the ReLU activation function, then the second linear layer, and then we simply return this. And here, be careful, we don't want an activation function and also, so no softmax at the end. So this is because then later um, we do the, we, we use this. But first of all, um, yeah, after defining the class, we then create the instance. So here we say neural net with the input size, the hidden size and the number of classes. And now we want to leverage the GPU. So here we have the device equals CUDA because I could select the runtime is a GPU. So now to um, use the GPU, we need to push the model to the device and then later also for the tensors. And yeah, so this is the first step. Then we define the loss and optimizer. So for the loss, in this case, this is a multi-class classification. So for this, we usually use NN cross entropy loss. 
And for the optimizer, again, you could use SGD, or in this case, we use the Atom, which is also a very common optimizer. And again, this gets model parameters and the learning rate. And yeah, if we check the documentation, then we notice that the cross entropy loss needs the raw values in the end. So that's why we don't put a activation function in the forward pass in the end. So yeah, just be aware to check the documentation, what this needs as the input. And now we do our training loop that we've seen before. And now we have two for loops and usually we always have two for loops. So the first one, iterates over the number of epochs that we specified. So for epoch in num epochs. And now the second one iterates over the training loader. So like I said, we can iterate over the data loader in an optimized way. And this will now iterate over all the different batches. And here again, we extract them. So we extract them to the images X and the labels Y. And now um, we need to reshape the images to be in this size. So for this, we can use tensor.reshape. And then also remember to push this to the device because now we want to use the GPU and the same for this. So if you forget this, for example, here, then I think your code will crash. So if you move your model to the device, then also make sure to move the tensors to the device. So um, then first we do the forward pass and the loss calculation. So here we simply call model. Then we call the criterion. So this is the loss. So usually, yeah, we call when we create this, we say this is the criterion. Then we call the criterion with the output. So the predictions and the actual labels. And now this is our loss. And then we say loss backward, optimizer step and optimizer zero grad. So these are always the same steps. And now we can run this and then this should do the training and print the steps. So now training is done and we can see that the loss slowly decreased. So I think this is working. Um, of course, you can increase the number of epochs and train this even longer. But now let's see how we can test the model after training. So how we can evaluate this. And for this, we usually say with torch.nograd because now we no longer need the gradient tracking. And now we iterate over the test loader. So we say for images and labels in test loader. Then again, make sure to reshape this and push this to the device and the same for the labels. Then again, we call the model and get the predictions. And now to get the actual predicted values, the predicted classes, remember these are just the raw values. Now we call torch.max. This will give us the output value and then also the index. And this is the index of the prediction. And then we compare this by saying predicted equals equals labels dot sum and add this to the number of correct values. And then we divide this by the number of total samples. And this is the accuracy. And now if we run this and print this, then you see the accuracy of the network on the 10,000 test images is 97%. So this is pretty accurate and this worked pretty well. Now let's learn how to create a convolutional neural network or short CNN. So in the previous example, we simply used a fully connected neural network with one hidden layer. So here we applied two linear layers and one ReLU activation function in between. And now we learn about convolutional layers, max pooling layers, and also how we can save and load the model. So the first part is very similar. Again, we have our imports, then we define the device and the hyperparameters. Then we again define the transforms we want to apply. And in this case, we want to apply two. So we put this in transforms compose. And then as a list, first we transform this to a tensor and then we normalize the images to be in the range minus one and one. So for this, we apply this as the mean and this as the standard deviation for all the three color channels. 
So this will normalize the images and then we have a tensor in the range minus one and one. Then in this example, we want to use the built-in Cypher 10 dataset. So again, we can find this in TorchVision dataset Cypher 10 and we specify the root, training, download and now the transform. And by the way, of course, if you want to use your own datasets, for example, then you can use datasets.image folder and specify the folder where we where you prepared your own images. But the approach is again the very same with this training dataset and test dataset. Then after the data set, we define the training loader and then the test loader. So this is the built-in data loader with the data set, the batch size and shuffle equals true for training. Then we define the classes. So here I want to show you how this looks like. So I have this little helper function. Then again, I create a iter object and call iter next and then im show. And now if you run this, then this will download the data set the first time we use this and then plot this. And yeah, this is how the Cypher 10 data set looks like. So now we deal with color images. And now we define our convolutional neural net. So again, we define our model class confnet. This inherits from nn.module. Then again, we need to implement init and forward. And in the init, we again call super init. And then here we define all the layers that we want. So now we want to apply a few convolutional layers and in between we want max pooling and we also want again relu activation functions. And then in the end of our network, we want to apply two linear layers because we want to do classification in the end. So um, the conf2d layer, if we hover over this and have a look at the documentation, then you see it gets the in channels, the out channels and the kernel size and then some more optional parameters. But these three are important. And the first one, three input channels is because we have three color channels in the images, red, green and blue. So this is fixed and with all the other parameters you can play around. It's only important that the output size of the previous layer matches the input size of the next layer. So if we have 32 as output size, then we need 32 as input size here. And then after all the convolutions, we need to make sure to know the size of the linear layers. And for this, I show you how I can determine this. So yeah, here we define all the layers and we also define max pooling of size two by two. So if we Google max pooling, then we see this is a very simple op operation to basically it reduces the image size. For example, if we have a two by two window, then it looks at this window and simply takes the largest value and writes it into the output and the same for the next window and so on. So this is how max pooling works. And this is a very popular layer that we apply in convolutional neural nets. So we also define this in the init. And now in the forward, we apply all the layers. So in our case, um, the input shape of the of X is N. So the, the batch size then three color channels and 32 by 32 is the image size. Then if you are not sure um, how this looks like, what I like to do is that after each step, I print x.shape and then I run this and um, have a look at the output. And if you do this, then you see the first convolution gives us this input at uh, this output, sorry, then max pooling with this size will usually cut this in half. So it's only 32 by 15 by 15. Then we get this output. Then again, we do pooling. Then again, we get this output. And now we see 64 and then the image size is only four by four. So now if we flatten this, we get this number as input shape. That's why here we have to apply 
64 times 4 times 4 and then again 64 and here 64 and the 10 as output is fixed because we have 10 output classes and yeah so this is how now our convolutional neural network class looks like and one thing to note here is that in this case we use f.relu and apply the activation function directly so we could do it this way or we can also like in the last example we defined this as a layer and then called it like this so i think it's just a matter of personal preference both are uh, perfectly fine so yeah in this case we apply them directly here and don't put them in the init but yeah this is how we can implement a convolutional neural net then again we create our model and push it to the device then again we create our cross entropy loss and the optimizer so this is the very same than before then we iterate over the number of epochs and we iterate over the training loader then again we need to push this to the device then we do the forward pass by calling the model then calculating the loss and then we say optimizer zero grad loss backward and optimizer step you could also do it the other way around like before so this is not important it's only important that after each iteration or before each iteration you make sure to empty the gradients again and in this example i want to calculate a so-called running loss so for this i initialize this with zero and then for each batch i add this to the running loss so here we say loss item and then i divide this by the number of total steps so this will give us the average loss for this epoch and but again the the rest of the code is the exact same than before the only difference is now that here we use a different model and now let's run this and then um, do the training and after the training to load uh, to save the model we call torch save and we could um, only put in the model here and the path where we want to store this this would work but usually you call model state dict this will only store the dictionary with the parameters so the train parameters and yeah this is how we can save the model and now let's wait until the training is finished all right so training is finished and we can see that the loss decreased so this worked and also if we have a look at the folder then here we see this cnn.pth so this is the saved model state dict and pth is just a very common file ending for the pytorch models so yeah this is the saved model and now we want to load this again so since we only saved the state dict and not the entire model we have to create a new model instance so we say loaded model equals confnet and then we call loaded model dot load state dict and be careful this doesn't get the path but it gets the loaded object so here we say torch load path and then we push this to the device since we want to use the GPU again. And we also say loaded model.eval. This will just set some internal configurations so they, that they are um, better for the um, evaluation and not for training. For example, if we hover over this, then you can see it affects layers like dropout or batch norm. Um, yeah, just remember this to set this to eval if you don't train the model and um, then here we do our evaluation so this is the same than before we say with torch no grad then we iterate over the test loader push it to the device call the model and then call torch max and compare this with the labels and call the sum and i do this one time with the model from the last step and one time with the loaded model and then i print the accuracy to show you that this is the same and now if we run this and evaluate the model and also the loaded model then you see this is the exact same accuracy so 70.71 percent accuracy 
Um, this is not perfect yet, but it's working. And of course you can play around with the number of epochs and train this longer or play around with the hyperparameters or with the architecture here. So yeah, I encourage you to improve this yourself, but now you also know how to save and load the model. And yeah, these are all the important steps that I wanted to show you in this crash course. I hope you really enjoyed this course and found this helpful. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Also, if you want to learn more about the underlying deep learning concepts, then have a look at our Deep Learning Explain series here on YouTube. And also, if I went over a few of these concepts too quickly and you want a slower approach, then I have a more than four hours long PyTorch course also on YouTube and I will also put the links in the description. So feel free to check this out and then I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.